research at Lincoln Labs called Project Automate. Um, I was lucky enough to, to lead the uh, winning team uh, alongside uh, Nick Armstrong Cruz, who couldn't be here today. Uh, but special recognition goes to uh, Michael Carroll, who's probably one of the most active on the uh, Ross forums. Um, but he essentially was critical in making the system actually work at the end. Um, so again, I, I would have to, you know, uh, I wish he was here to, to enjoy uh, all the fruits of, of his labor. Um, but, uh, but what I want to try to do is give sort of a system level overview of uh, what we constructed to solve uh, this challenge. Um, and so I'll be sort of disseminating ideas and lessons learned um, that hopefully can assist others in the uh, development, deployment, and, and just, you know, just sort of the, the fun of building uh, a multi-agent system to handle very, very complex problems. Um, but I'll start with the details of the actual challenge. So uh, Project Automate um, concentrated on this UGV UAV collaborative system um, that described up here, will traverse a maze-like course while avoiding obstacles and executing specific tasks. Um, when we got this internal, that's, that's all the information they gave us. They wanted this to be very open-ended. We had to submit proposals. Um, three teams were selected to compete in a six-month uh, challenge. So from, you know, from the time they say, okay, you can start working on this, to the time we had to deploy our system, um, it was in the course of six months and very, very time constraining. Uh, but it was a lot of fun and it was to uh, not only uh, induce collaboration at Lincoln, but sort of get some robotics technology working through the system because robotics is in a traditional mich mission area uh, for Lincoln. And so when the uh, challenge rules came out, um, they were actually quite, quite uh, straightforward. So we had this maze that was going to be constructed. You can think of this as two um, tennis courts side by side. And so there's a, a start and finish to the maze. So we would deploy the robots from here. They would have to find the uh, end goal and you'd get 100 points for that. Um, we had bonus markers where two out of three possible markers would appear. And so if this robot found those, you would get uh, was it 20 points? And then if you traverse uh, three of the hazards, three out of these possible four hazards, uh, you would lose 25 points, okay? So this was an optimization problem. And it was good because we actually had defined, um, defined values to program into our system. So we felt that the planning portion of this uh, could be relatively straightforward if we could get sort of the rest of the autonomy to work, which is a very, very difficult task. Um, this challenge was also not time-based, it was actually uh, distance travel base. So every cell that the robot traversed, so a cell would be maybe a five, I think it was a five foot by five foot box, um, you would lose a point. Um, and so this was actually split up into two main rounds. So the first one, you had, uh, you could deploy your UAV or UAVs, you can use multiple robots. Um, and then you had 15 minutes where humans could intervene as, you know, when the UAVs came back before deploying the UGVs, which actually solved the maze. The second round consisted of the UAV, UGV pair, or however many robots you needed to deploy, but no human, uh, no human involvement. Um, and you were limited to about 60 to 90 minutes per round, otherwise you would get a cost of infinity. Um, so that's bad, we, we tried to avoid that. Um, okay, so the key systems design. So I'm here to talk about the specifics of the, the system that we deployed. Um, it was enabled by Ross, it was enabled by all the con contributions over the years by the open source community. Um, and we certainly wouldn't have been able to do this without that. So this is, you know, I, I'm in recognition of all, of everyone's hard work um, at, the, at this conference and, and around the world. Uh, but there's four key points that we sort of wrote down and, and followed and, and really helped us along to really solve this challenge. So the first one is the system that we designed was modular and scalable. So we used ROS, but we used multiple robots basically in a multi-master configuration. So there's been talk about multi-master, there's been a lot of work, we even tried the uh, FKIE implementation of multi-master. Um, we ended up designing our own, but using a lot of sort of the uh, tricks of the trade that have been uh, talked about over the years in, in, in the Ross community. Um, and essentially that allowed us to have these independent systems that we could mesh together in, our, in basically our own protocol. But as far as the development of all the autonomy, that happened within the ROS framework, and that was very important. Um, when you have such a complicated system and you have really complicated tasks, so this sounds very straightforward, but it turned out to be a, a huge challenge, 
Um, simple fail-safe behaviors always work the best. So we started with this dream of we're going to have robots that you know, cook breakfast as they're going to solve the maze. And really, in the end, we, we had very straightforward rules, being very confident that we weren't going to run into any deadlocks due to you know, multi-agent interaction. But also, predetermined timeouts were critical. So for instance, running the race, the robot wouldn't wait for an infinite time for, you know, for the baton to be passed if the baton obviously wasn't going to get there. Um, so that was, that was very helpful. We also uh, developed these state machines using Smash, um, basically the Smash architecture. We didn't use Smash implementation because we wrote in C++, but the viewers and all the utilities for that were, were essential. Um, this is not very novel right now because of the DRC, but we uh, used Gazebo and we used it in a distributed faster fashion such that we could use the hardware that was going to act as the brains of the actual robots um, in, for instance, a room networked together to gazebo over very, very fast ethernet lines, but the robot brains would communicate using the wireless architecture that we used on the deployed system. So we got to test everything out even before we touched the hardware, which was great. Um, and then, uh, sort of, we're very good at, at Lincoln at sort of mission, uh, you know, plans and, and uh, strategizing con ops. And so, exploiting uh, a priori knowledge of what was given to us was was essential in the uh, eventual approach we did for our system. So that's sort of uh, the the four key system design points that I want to sort of. Uh, to introduce in the beginning, and then now I'm actually going to get into the meat of our technology. So um, uh, a quick, uh, quick plug for my friends at Ascending Technologies. So we use the Pelican platform, um, and you can put a lot of stuff on a Pelican. So we ended up taking this and we uh, put a 30 meter LiDAR inverted. In fact, I'm surprised that this isn't used uh, more often than it is, but we put it basically upside down uh, under the base and had the two reflective mirrors such that we got uh, height estimations as well as uh, 30 meter out uh, horizontal scans, which I'll discuss in a little bit. We had a, 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 D, um, a disassembled uh, fit PC um, as our main brains for the Pelican. However, a lot of the controls worked outside, or the low level controls worked outside of ROS on board this 32 uh, bit microcontroller, which comes on their autopilot board. Uh, we had a forward facing um, Connect type sensor, it was actually an Asus Xteon, um, and a custom COM board. Uh, and this sort of made up our UAV design. We had two of these, and I'll show you uh, what we were able to do that in a little bit. Uh, for our UGV, we actually uh, developed our, our own multi uh, or omnidirectional platform. And in fact, if you take off a lot of the stuff up top, the first thing we wanted to do was just create an omnidirectional breadboard, optical breadboard. And so you just built everything on top of that, depending on what, for instance, computation you need. So we could just stack laptops here. We put a uh, Android phone in the front. Uh, we put eight touch sensors custom made around the perimeter. Um, up here we had a gimbal with a uh, Xteon and a, and a uh, Android for sensing and integrating into the cost map for our planners. We had access points from uh, Ubiquiti, which worked very, very well. Um, and in fact, we built this platform very early on, even before we got specifics of the challenge, because we wanted to do reconnaissance. So we were, actually had access to the tennis bubble where this challenge was going to be um, to be run. So they said you can do anything you want in the, in the tennis bubble, just don't damage it. So we took our ground robot and we actually took two LIDARs, one horizontal, one vertical, and you can see that you can create very, very detailed three-dimensional three point clouds just by running SLAM on the horizontal LIDAR and then you get very nice structure of this, of, of this tennis bubble, of this challenge area. You can see the, the nets for the two tennis courts here. If you zoom in, there's a lot of features which will come into play during the challenge uh, when we need to solve the maze, including, you can start seeing up there, these light fixtures, okay, which quads don't really like light fixtures, um, and a lot of the other details on the side and me sort of stopping the robot um, uh, for the data collect. So we instantly threw this in Gazebo because we wanted to upfront be able to simulate sort of our system, again, using the hardware that's going to be used on the final robot and also sort of conjure up our dream maze of what this might look like. So this wasn't given to us uh, upfront. Um, and so we said, okay, what's the worst case scenario of the maze that they give, give us? We also put the important features that would affect motion planning uh, and possibly localization tasks, okay, inside the Gazebo model. Um, so this was a very intensive process up front, but it paid off um, you know, over and over again throughout our, our design phase. Um, to get into the baseline co con ops of what we, uh, what we did, I'm just going to concentrate on one aerial vehicle and uh, two ground robots. So the idea would be is even for both rounds, we would deploy 
the uh, UAV in sort of a lawnmower fashion to try to get some reconnaissance from the, from the sky. Okay, we wanted to do some sort of mapping such that we could give a prior to the ground robots which would eventually do exploration, what we called exploitation, or try to solve the maze as optimally as possible. So after the lawnmower phase, um, the, uh, the UAV would land. We only had about a 10 minute window uh, to collect data uh, due to the battery limitations. And then the first U UGV that went out, started from the start, would then go and explore the maze, possibly in the areas where a lot of this information wasn't picked up from the UAV, okay? So this is the ex exploration phase. But the idea is once it's done exploring, it's not going to try to solve the maze. So where I stopped it, the Explorer robot actually sits right next to the end goal. And so the idea was if you didn't declare that you solved the maze with one of your robots, the second robot can go be penalized and, and be rewarded for the markers and for the cells that it traverses, and then solve the maze and you could you know, accrue a very, very high cost for your first UGV. Um, and so this was, this was sort of the technique that we did. We called it explore, exploration and exploitation. And so again, given the locations of these markers, it would try to traverse, get the bonuses, avoid the hazards, and then solve the maze, okay? So now getting into more technical details of how we accomplished this, we, you really see the, um, the sort of how we relied on everything that was available during, uh, in the Ross community. So by the way, we used Ross Fuerte because this challenge was held last year when Groovy was released. And so we, we, we stuck with Fuerte. Um, for our SLAM algorithm, we uh, incorporated both G-mapping and Carto, and in fact didn't select which SLAM algorithm we would use until the day of the challenge. And I'll get into why, why that was the case in a second. But you can see, obviously, we implemented the navigation stack. Um, we actually used the Bosch exploration package and tweaked it a little bit, but that worked very well for us. And so we did, this was a basically a slam problem, especially for the exploration phase. For marker identification, we used a lot of the open CV utilities. And in fact, when I said, you know, trying to keep the system as simple as possible, this was so critical, uh, especially for marker detection. So very simple color segmentation, edge detection, clustering, convex hull, match color histogram, based upon a library that we were given up front, this was, this was known to us, um, we were able to identify the, the markers pretty well. Um, the thing that was a little bit difficult is they decided to make the challenge area, so this is a, uh, an image from the aerial vehicle, um, they put down mats of blue color, and so that sort of made sort of this color detection um, a little bit tricky, but, but we were able to, to, to pull it off. Um, and so this is what actually uh, looks like uh, working on the ground robot, okay? So once it identifies a marker, we're gonna have to incorporate the, this somehow into cost map. In fact, we use cost map 2D. Um, so we have these markers that are the locations of, let's say, a reward and a, and a hazard. And then this would be incorporated with the SLAM, you know, the output of the SLAM map, okay, to basically input into the cost map, do a dynamic program task to find the optimal path. Now, in Fuerte, we, it actually took us a lot of time to incorporate sort of these penalties and these costs in this framework. Um, using cost map 2D, it wasn't as general as we were hoping. Um, but we were able to sort of tweak it a little bit um, such that we got the behavior as expected. So I don't know if we're actually solving the exact optimal problem, but we're solving something pretty close. And as you can see, the uh, path that's generated goes through what it considers the bonuses and tries to avoid the hazards. Um, and in fact, here we're not doing uh, SLAM, we're actually taking a map that was, let's say, built by the Explorer robot, so this would be the second robot going, the, explo uh, the Exploiter robot, and in fact, we're using uh, AMCL to localize um, as we go along. Okay, so that's sort of just the lead-in to what we were expecting to do. And so, uh, come game day, uh, we, we take a look at the, uh, the maze, and all of you should recognize something very clearly up front. Um, they decided to use meshes for the fences, okay? And for those who use LIDAR, know that that's not a very good thing. Um, so in fact, that uh, made it a very late night for us. But, you know, a lot of the clustering techniques, and also we found that Cardo worked a lot better, not only for that, but for the long segmentations of the maze um, for our ground robot uh, SLAM algorithm. For the aerial robot, we, we were lucky enough to have a very, very skilled pilot uh, operating over uh, the May. So again, this is the first day where we weren't actually doing the rounds. We were just allowed to sort of play around in the, in the maze environment. Um, and in fact, his lawnmower pattern was, was so good that we were thinking about just brass bagging it and replaying it uh, for, our, for, our, uh, for our actual runs. Uh, we felt that was cheating, but we, we generated a 
a lawnmower pattern very close to what he was doing. But you can see that you know, we were operating within these light fixtures, but because we did extensive testing within Gazebo, this wasn't a surprise to us. We, were, we, uh, we didn't lose any of the air vehicles during the challenge, which was um, not the most likely outcome. Um, okay, so here's what, here's what you get from the air vehicle. So we're doing localization, which I'll describe in a, in a slide up front, but there was a talk with the Octomap, okay, uh, earlier today, and it's an excellent, excellent package. Um, and in fact, if you get, you know, we got reasonable um, localization, and we actually fixed this between round one and round two. But remember, round one, we were allowed to have human in intervention. So generating sort of this three-dimensional representation of the maze, we were able to manually insert sort of a bias into the ground robots to try to solve the maze, the one that was actually solving the problems. We were able to also you know, identify markers and manually insert them um, into the plan of the UGV, at least for the first round, uh, which was really nice because that was sort of the warm-up to the more difficult second round. And so uh, given that, um, we took what the, the information coming from the air vehicle, and here's um, what happened with first round. So in fact, uh, our bias didn't work initially. It went down the wrong path, but eventually it found out the right way. Um, it turns out that we think what happened here is there was a, a, a bonus marker sort of up top in the right, and the robot sort of just scrambles around trying to find it, and eventually it times out and just says, ah, screw it, and uh, goes and solves the maze. And in fact, we were able to solve this very large maze, again, um, the, the length of, uh, or the size of two um, tennis courts, okay? You see we cover a very, very small fraction of the maze because of the information that we got with the air vehicle. Um, and uh, I think it took about, this was about a 12 minute run, okay? But again, we weren't, uh, we weren't in any rush. We rather make sure that our mapping uh, algorithm uh, was working uh, quite nicely. So we actually limited the speed because uh, we were using a, a less powerful laser on the ground robot. But the really interesting thing um, is sort of this UAV autonomous mapping, okay? And so because we had the profile of the bubble, you can see that these LiDAR scans, all right, are, are moving around as the robot is sort of traversing the maze. But since we knew this a priori, we could build the profile back in to the, uh, to the localization algorithm and localize pretty well. So this is just an accumulation of the, um, of the Octomap and then slicing at a particular height, about one meter. I guess the, um, the fences were about 1.3 meters high. And, um, and so this was for the second round, okay? So this robot would go out, it would uh, collect this information, and in fact, this construction didn't actually happen on the uh, air vehicle. It was transferred as a bag file down to one of the UGVs. This reconstruction is actually on one of the UGVs. So it's playing it, building a map, and then we had to figure out how to actually extract that map and bring it in such that we could bias the or exploration phase, which then we would have to then take its result and put in the exploitation phase. Uh, I'm gonna skip that sort of map merging uh, for this slide, but just show you the results of the UGV exploration. So again, this is the one that sort of solves the map but doesn't actually solve the map. Uh, and in fact, what it's doing is it's filling in areas where there's a lot of uncertainty due to the information that was coming from the UAV. Um, and so in fact, actually it solves the maze. It doesn't solve it as efficiently as uh, round one, but that's okay. And in fact, actually it goes out, but it doesn't indicate that it, solved the, it, it so actually solved the maze. Now, getting into map merging, I mentioned we uh, use Cardo. So uh, what we did is we actually opened up Cardo and allowed it to take a second topic of laser scans to actually recreate the map based upon a sequence of laser scans. Okay, from a Bayesian formulation, this is a horrendous thing to do. Uh, but we found out that it works pretty nicely because we have, um, we know the starting point of the ground robot to very, very high accuracy uh, because it's repeated over and over and over again for these deployments. Um, and so given that, um, the round two, uh, we were able to exploit just like we were, well, in fact, we solved it for exploiter. And then we sort of indicated that, you know, we put on a show for everyone, which, which, uh, which, was, a, which was a great time. We were very happy to see that, that this all worked out. But all this, you know, formulates into solving the challenge. However, our real interest was, you know, sort of the data collects and sort of the autonomy that we could get for maybe a real life system, okay? So for a real life task. And so here, you know, we have a large now data set that we're using at Lincoln trying to improve these algorithms, which we 
hope to, to release to the public um, after an extensive re review process because a lot of it is based upon pre-existing packages because we certainly wouldn't be able to do this from scratch by ourselves. Um, and so with that, I, I'll conclude. Uh, I just want to give recognition to my team and also mention that out of this nine-person team, only Nick, myself, and Michael Kerr have Ross experience before this. So this shows how powerful Ross can be even to a, a, new, you know, a new engineer, a new programmer, um, to do very, very complicated tasks. And uh, with that, I'll conclude and take any questions.